Uh, what I'm going to show you is a demonstration we have at the research farm in southwest Iowa. It's about 50 miles east of Omaha. Uh, so it will be very similar to what you've got in the eastern quarter of Nebraska. Not so similar to, to out here in Dawson County. Uh, but uh, feel free to stop me at any point and ask questions if you want to. Uh, otherwise, I'll just kind of ramble through this and then we'll talk. Uh, so here's an aerial photo of the farm. Uh, what we've got is a 160 head uh, open feedlot on the farm and there's also a 120 head confinement feeding operation for cattle at the same location. So we've got a total of 280 head which puts us really close to that 300 head uh, where uh, we would not be a small animal feeding operation in AFO, we could possibly be a CAFO. Uh, downhill from that feedlot, uh, the runoff would run about 600 feet. 500 feet down uh, the slope through a grass waterway, cross a road, and then go another 1,000 feet through a grass waterway out through the field, cross another road, and then hit what uh, EPA and Iowa DNR, I'm sure, would call a water course, uh, a very small stream, but it's got bed and banks and flows water uh, a good portion of the year. Uh, so, in getting down that hill, uh, that runoff crosses roads through culverts, uh, pipelines, twice, and in fact, depending on which EPA or DNR inspector you're talking to, the outlet from our settling basin, our debris basin, uh, is a pipe. Uh, they might count that one too. Uh, so clearly, since we're crossing through pipelines on the way to that water of the state or water of the U.S. down there, we could be considered a confined animal feeding operation, a CAFO, if we had just a few more animals uh, and if the runoff ever reached that stream down there after crossing through two culverts. Uh, so we thought we maybe should take a look at, at what we're doing there and try to figure out how to make sure that doesn't happen very often. Uh, so again, looking at that site, uh, the area just down slope from the feedlot and settling basin, uh, the farm manager told me he would let me use a little bit of farm ground there. Uh, he didn't want me to get carried away, but I could have some of it to experiment with. So we uh, built a treatment area just uh, down slope from the debris basin, the settling basin. Which one do you call them here in Nebraska? Settling basin? Debris basin? Settling, settling basin. basin. Good. That's what we're used to in Iowa. I can switch to that. Uh, so I used an area about one-third the size of the feedlot drainage area. It drains about an acre and a quarter. I only used about a third of an acre there of his farm ground. And when the settling basin fills up, you don't have a remote control for this, do you? So I don't have to keep no, stepping in here. In That's right. I'll just sit down. You don't need me standing up. Uh, the settling basin fills uh, with a rainfall event. Uh, when the basin gets full, it overflows through a pipeline uh, to a flat bench terrace that we built on the farm there. Uh, when that flat bench terrace fills up, it overflows to a second one, the stair step down the hillside, to a third one, to a fourth one. If all four of those bench terraces get full, it overflows again back into the waterway where it would have gone otherwise anyhow. Looking at uh, how that was built, uh, I just went out there uh, in May of 07, uh, staked out some contour lines on the side of the hill. It's about 8 to 10 percent slope, so it was too steep really to make a good uh, sloped VTA, uh, the water would have run through it too quickly, we were afraid. Uh, I staked out the contour lines and I just got skid loader and the tractor loader out there because we didn't want to bring any heavy equipment in. And besides that, I'm too cheap to rent equipment. Uh, pushed up the little terraces with the skid loader. Uh, so we got four flat benches there. They're level from end to end. They're level from side to side. Just pushed up the berms with the skid loader. They vary in width from about 15 feet at the narrowest to almost 30 feet at the widest point. I didn't worry about trying to make them uniform widths or anything, just followed the contours so it was as little earth moving as possible uh, to get that done. Uh, so this is in June of 07. The next month, uh, it wasn't completely finished with them yet, didn't have any seating on them yet, didn't have overflow structures built from one to the next, but we got a two and a quarter inch rain over an eight hour period. It uh, came out of the settling basin and filled all four of those benches. Uh, they varied at that point from maybe two to four inches deep. Uh, I filled them all up and overflowed on down the waterway. Uh, so here it is at the end of that two and a quarter inch rainfall event. And here it is 20 hours later. Uh, the top three benches pretty well soaked away. The bottom one was a little bit deeper, uh, it was still holding a little bit of water. We have really good infiltration rates in our soils there at the site. Even though it's on a hillside, 
Uh, it's still in the deep plus, uh, really good infiltration rates. We can get rid of water fairly quickly if we just hold it there on the soil for a while. Here it is in August of that same year. You can see I had a really good growth of weeds on everything, no grass yet. Uh, I did have overflows put into place now so I could hold the water deeper, five to six inches deep in each of those benches rather than a couple inches deep. So this was uh, two consecutive rainfall events, uh, 1.8 and a 1.2 uh, back to back. And, and with that much rain, a little over, or right at three inches, I only filled the top two benches that time because I could hold the water a little deeper after putting in the overflow structures. It does operate in the winter too when we get snow melt. Here it was in February uh, with some snow melt and the water was coming out of the settling basin, filling that first bench, uh, melting the snow that was in the bench. The overflow structure on that is just a simple wooden box structure with a pipe coming out the back side of it uh, to drain the water out of the rest of the basin uh, after the rainfall was done. I had a piece of flexible pipe on there. I just dropped the end of the flexible pipe into the water uh, to drain it. Um, that didn't work quite as well as I wanted to. It was hard to hold that pipe down in the water. I had to shove a pitchfork over it. Uh, nobody liked that. Uh, so I switched to just a, a toilet flush valve at the bottom and just pull on it with a rope. And actually that worked quite well, except the rodents would chew on it in the winter time. I'd have to replace it every spring, but you know, they're, what, a dollar and a quarter a piece? Uh, pretty cheap. So uh, it works, uh, very, not very professional, but uh, that's how I got the water out of it. The water coming out of the settling basin, uh, what Iowa producers refer to, it's just brown water, uh, and that's a good description of it, it's brown water. Uh, you get to the opposite end of that first bench, uh, 120 some feet away, after moving across through the grass, it's still brown water. Uh, when it overflows to bench number two, three, four, and if it ever gets to the waterway, it's still brown water. And when it gets to the road, it's still brown water. And it's going to stay brown water for uh, longer than we want to hold it. Uh, people who think you can clean up feedlot effluent by running it through grass, it's going to filter it. And so it just does not filter. Uh, the stuff that's suspended in that water is fine enough particles, you have to hold it dead still for a long time before that's not going to be brown water. Uh, so, our goal here is not to filter anything. Uh, the goal is to infiltrate this water so that the nutrients get trapped in the soil because you're not going to fish that out with any kind of standing grass you run it through. So, that's the level benches that we built to, to handle the runoff from the feedlot. Uh, once we got that done, uh, one of the other engineers, uh, like me, uh, in Northwest Iowa, said, well, instead of dropping all the water there, wouldn't you rather take that water up into the cornfield and put it someplace where you can get some use out of those nutrients? Because the grass I'm growing in these benches, uh, we don't harvest. They're too small to try to get equipment in there to cut it and bale it. And I thought, well, yeah, that would be nice. We could use those nutrients. So he suggested, let's just drop a little pump in the settling basin. Uh, and it's nothing fancy, it's just a $120, uh, 120 volt sewage pump, that's all it is. Um, so uh, nothing fancy here, um, but it works. Uh, we don't have to lift the water very far, only lifting it about four or five feet to get it out to the field. And we just tried distributing it through an inch and a half plastic pipe with half inch holes drilled in it. Uh, we drilled a hole every six feet, so we'd run it every other row. Uh, 60 inches every other row down through the field so when it was pumping it would just pump out every other row and run down the hillside uh, between the rows of crop out there uh, with the half inch holes it was squirting out fast enough that it made a, a fair amount of foam out there in the field and we eventually switched to a little larger hole uh, so we didn't have quite as much pressure drop there but here you can see it flowing down the hill uh, that pump doesn't pump very fast, so it doesn't pump a high enough flow rate to run it all the way to the bottom of the hill to uh, the grass waterway. It stays there in the field almost every time it pumps, uh, unless it had rained a lot right before that. Uh, in the growing crop, it looks like that, uh, running down the rows. Um, seems to work fairly well. The, the water didn't stay between the rows as well as I wanted it to, uh, so we ended up uh, replacing that rigid plastic pipe with just more lay flat hose like we used to get it out to the field. Just cut holes in the lay flat hose. I had moved them to 10 feet apart instead of 60 inches apart, spread it over a little bigger area because it tended to jump across rows, uh, and that seems to work just fine and is a little easier to handle. 
uh, running down the rows kind of looks the same as it did before. Uh, a lot of people come and look at the system uh, and producers. Uh, I'm always impressed because they'll look at it and think of better ways to do it than what we did. Um, but a lot of interest in this, folks like to talk about making better use of that feedlot effluent, getting it out in the field where they can capture the nutrients and make use of them and have less risk of going down that grass waterway. And they're always really curious about the equipment we used and, and I know every one of them is going to go home and do it for less money than we did and have it be a, more reliable than ours. Uh, so why do we do this? Well, in Western Iowa we get about 90 days a year with precipitation. About 75% of those are under half an inch, so we may not get any runoff out of the pens with a, a lot of those precipitation events, but about 10% of them, or about 10 events a year, are over an inch, about 3% are over two inches, and uh, about 1%, usually just one or two events a year, are over three inches, and that's enough to push water down the hill to the stream at the bottom of the hill. Uh, if you're curious, you say, well, the one-day event's not really what's going to cause you trouble. It's going to be when you get two, three, four days in a row with rain. That's where it's going to get hard to check to manage. And I think you're right about that. If you're trying to estimate uh, how much would that be, how much water, I look back over 20 years of rainfall data from our farm, uh, and if you increase the maximum one-day rainfall event by about 20%, that'd be about what you'd expect in the worst three-day uh, period, or if you want to know for a whole week, it'd be about 50% more than the maximum one-day rainfall event. And you might ask, well, how well does this system work? I didn't invest much in it. Uh, this is just made to try to control the, large, uh, the discharges coming out of the feedlot uh, from moderate-sized rainfall events. We've got good soil infiltration, and we can capture and hold in the settling basin and the four benches uh, about a four inch rainfall event. You get more than four inches at once, it's going to overflow and send it on down the waterway to excess. We went uh, from discharging about 20 times a year to that grass waterway down to discharging four times in the last seven years. Uh, so on average, less than once a year that we're actually discharging down the waterway and crossing the road. It's not a zero discharge system. It will still discharge if we get more than four, four and a half inches at one time. But it does control all but the biggest rainfall events. Uh, in Iowa, our rules for non-permit sized feedlots say uh, you just can't cause a water quality violation with any discharge that you have. You must settle solids and then not cause a water quality violation. Uh, I think this system will do that because by the time we get to a four and a half inch rain, uh, the stream's going to be running really heavy with sediment <coughs> already, uh, and what we add probably won't cause any kind of a water quality violation, but it still will be a discharge under those really large rainfall events. So, that's it. Any questions? Yes? Did you, because I walked in late, did you say Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, it is sized just to meet the minimum Iowa uh, law requirement, uh, which works out to, I mean, it's five minutes of retention time uh, with a 10-year, one-hour rainfall event. Comes out to about 1 39th the surface area of the drainage area that runs into it by at least eight inches deep. So, so we can hold a, about a third of an inch of uh, runoff in our southern base. 